Welcome to Days of Roar, a Detroit Tiger podcast brought to you by the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorash. I'm here with Free Press beat writer Evan Petzold. We're here on the break between Christmas and New Year's doing the last Days of Roar of 2023. We have an exciting guest. We have a few things to talk about, but most importantly, what was Christmas, Ev? Christmas was excellent, man. I had a great time. It was awesome hanging out with family. I want to thank my wife, Savannah, my mother, Jennifer, and my mother-in-law, Malia, for making it great. And I had a chance to spend Christmas Eve with my family and then Christmas Day with Savannah's family. And, you know, Savannah and I, we have some of our own traditions that we also blend in as well, just the two of us that were, um, you know, been able to kickstart over the last couple of years. So it's great. I, I love this time of year. Spending time with family is always great. I'm glad you had a good time. The Gorashes spent their Christmas day with all their family at the Simonian house, where it's a tradition that we do that. You did see a little boy there who I think got enough stickers and fake tattoos to last him till he's 11 years old this year. He enjoyed that. We had a great time. But let's get into the baseball because some things have happened recently and the Tigers have made a few signings. You got a little, you know, deeper into the Jack Flaherty signing with with Scott. We're going to talk about that in a little while. They also signed a reliever. They think he has a lot of upside in Shelby Miller. Before we get to that, though, let's kind of roll straight into the big two so we can get to our guest. I want to get a little bit off beaten path before we get to Shelby Miller because there's been a question that's been bothering me this week because I'm starting to develop actual expectations for the team this year, which it's been quite some time since that's happened. So I said to myself, normally bad things seem to happen to the Tigers. So that being the case, I said, who are two players that you absolutely either need to perform or stay healthy, or it's really going to dunk on the impact and outcome of the 2024 season? And I was really curious who you thought those two players were, and let's see if it aligns with who I thought those two players were for me. Well, look, I'm going to give you two names right now, right off the bat, Colt Keith and Spencer Torkelson. Those are the two names for me. I think those are the guys that they have to meet expectations because the Tigers need to score runs. People are forgetting that, I think, a little bit. And maybe not because there's so much clamor for you know going out and getting a third baseman. I think you can live without having an everyday third baseman on your roster, a guy that you can lock in every day and feel really good about, an Alex Bregman type of player, right? You don't need that kind of guy to win the American League Central, I don't think. But I will tell you, you do need a second baseman at least. You can't have gaping holes at third base and second base in your lineup. You just can't. That's just not going to fly. And so I think Colt Keith needs to perform to expectations. He's a guy who's expected to make the opening day roster as the everyday second baseman. I expect him to get the Riley Green treatment playing almost every day. Um, Could slide up in the lineup very quickly. A guy who hit 306 last year with 27 home runs, 60 walks, 121 strikeouts, and 126 games at double-A Erie and triple-A Toledo. He's as good as it gets as a prospect. I have very high expectations for him, and I think he needs to meet those expectations. And the same is true for Spencer Torkelson, because I don't think that Spencer Torkelson is a 233 hitter. That's what he was last year, 233 with 31 home runs and 159 games. I think he's a 30-homer guy who could hit 250. And it's really going to come down to, is Spencer Torkelson going to strike out 25% of the time, or is he not? And I don't think Spencer Torkelson at his best strikes out 25% of the time. I think he probably strikes out somewhere between maybe 20 to 23% of the time. And I think that's a much better version of Torkelson. We're going to see maybe a little uptick in the walks, but more importantly, if he's able to cut back on the strikeouts, if he's able to file his plan a little bit better at the plate, we're going to see the batting average tick up, which is then going to increase the on-base percentage. The OPS is going to go up, going to be putting more balls in play. We should see more home runs. That makes him a more well-rounded hitter. Say what you want about the defense. I don't really care. I think a world in which Spencer Torkelson hits, say, 250 with 35 home runs, that's the expectation. That's a little bit of a better player than we saw last year. So I think the combination of those two things, that's the key for me. 
I have two totally different players, as most of the Days of Roar listeners will be ecstatic to know that we don't necessarily agree on this. Although, I think we agree more than you think. We just have different priorities. My two players, number one, no questions asked, Riley Green. Riley Green has to be Riley Green. Has to be Riley Green for the whole year, not 95 games. Need 135 to 140 games of Riley Green. But is it fair to expect that? Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's very fair to expect a 22 or three year old player to play 145 games. Okay. So it's time for him hitting three hole to be a four and a half war player to impact every game, to drive every month, to be a reliable force of nature and impact winning. And that's what needs to happen, number one. I was going to say number two is Tarek Skubal, but it's more fair to be worried about how durable he can be. So I have actually a strange second choice of who really impacts games. And if people have paid attention in the two seasons that the Tigers have been able to at least threaten being a reasonably decent baseball team. The way A.J. Hinch manages baseball games, he is bullpen dependent. And it's very difficult to be bullpen dependent and be a winning baseball team, a team that's going to win 85 plus games if your closer is not reliable. So the second person that I need to perform this year is Alex Lang. And to be really blunt about it, when you look at his numbers relative to the numbers of good closers, he pretty vastly underperformed last year. Save percentage was in the 80s, walked way too many hitters, and just became unbelievably unreliable, you know, after, you know, say post June 1st. So Alex Lang has the capacity to be really good and be really consistent. He just hasn't shown it yet. So my two choices, Riley Green, Alex Lang. No, good picks for sure. I think that the Lang choice in particular is is pretty shrewd to me, in my opinion. I, I just look at the Tigers and say, hey, man, they need offense. They need to score runs. They averaged 3.44 runs per game in 2022. And then they went out and they averaged 4.08 runs per game in 2023. That's just not going to do it if you really want to be in that upper echelon of teams and you want to make a run for – the American League Central, and, and have a chance in the postseason. And so that's where I see it, leaning heavily on offense, offense, offense. What can Colt Keith give you? What can Torkelson give you? I think Riley Green is right there in that boat. But to your point, you got to finish games at the back end. That's a big reason why they got Shelby Miller, though. And, and I think that is an interesting segue because the Tigers do feel like Shelby Miller is a guy who could pitch at the back end. Scott Harris came out and said it. They think he could pitch at the very back end of that bullpen. I'm not trying to steal question two of the big two away from you. Maybe you can guide us into that, but like, could Shelby Miller be that guy if Alex Lang can't? I mean, that's a huge question mark around this team right now. Well, I think asking Shelby Miller to be the closer is probably an order that uh, they're not planning on. And so let's transition to question two of the big two so we can get to our outstanding guest. Question two of the big two. The Tigers signed right-hand reliever Shelby Miller. What do we know about him? What do we think about the signing? What are some of the motivations behind why they did it? So you talked to uh, Scott Harris, plus you got some other input. Let's talk about it because at best, Shelby Miller was crazy shut down in 42 innings last year for the Dodgers, transformed his career, added a split to a prior fastball slider mix that basically for nine years and seven teams has been pretty pedestrian to be blunt about it. Uh, all of a sudden, they added the split all on the same plane, got crazy numbers, and really impacted his other two pitches. So let's talk about what the Tigers saw and what their plans are for him. Yeah, I mean, the splitter is the real deal. He developed that with the Dodgers last season and then obviously becomes a free agent and gets a one-year $3 million contract. The deal includes a 2025 club option, which is worth $4.25 million. The option comes with a $250,000 buyout. 
So look, this is a guy who could be around for two years. He's got performance bonuses and escalators in his contract that, you know, could allow him to make up to over $12 million over the next two years. Like that's not money that you're willing to put down for some random guy. Right. But he has to earn it. But the stuff is obviously there for him to be able to negotiate some of those performance bonuses and escalators into his contract. We'll see if he's able to get to them, but this is a guy who threw a 93.5 mile an hour four seam fastball, 85.6 mile per hour splitter, and an 82.1 mile per hour slider. The fastball comes from the lead extension, got up to 95 with ride. New splitter had a 30% whiff rate, and his slider moved like a sweeper. Like, this is a guy who has a complete arsenal coming out of the bullpen now that he's added the splitter. I'm very fascinated to see how he fits in. My question is like one durability because he spent more than two months on the injured list last season with neck pain. And it would end up being a herniated disc that was pinching a nerve. And so you miss two months with that and you come back and you fire 14 scoreless innings. That's, you know, 12 innings in the regular season, two innings in the postseason. So he was really good lights out down the stretch, like you said. And the question now becomes, look, a, can you like repeat this performance in the big leagues? Because that's been his biggest thing for the longest time. He has not been able to repeat this. He went from a really good starter to a really bad starter to a really bad reliever to now seemingly a really good reliever. So how long can you stay a good reliever? Is it repeatable? That's my first question. Second question is, can you stay healthy? Because you are getting older. And I do understand that there have been some health issues in the past, you know, staying on the field, right? So that, that's the second thing. And then the third is, how do you fit into the bullpen? And that's where I think he fits in great. Because you look at the fact that the Tiger, they don't have a splitter in the bullpen. Now, they've got a splitter in Kenta Maeda in the starting rotation, another splitter in the starting rotation with Casey Mize. They don't have a splitter in the bullpen. You have guys like Jason Foley, right? He's got the 95 mile, the 97 mile an hour turbo sinker. Lang has a swing and miss curveball. Chafin has the slink, the sinker slider combination. Will Vest has the slider in the mid 90s fastball. Tyler Holton has command of four plus pitches. Now you add a slide, a splitter into that group. I think it makes your bullpen better as a whole because you just added a new pitch characteristic, a new shape that, you know, opponents are going to have to think about. Where does he fit in in terms of leverage situations? All that has to be earned. You know, when you say it has to be earned, that's exactly how I feel about it. Shelby Miller, you got to earn your leverage opportunities. He's been in the league a long time. He almost has a classic shutdown reliever profile now. Failed starter, now coming back, tweaked his arsenal, has pitched quite a few innings, now transitioning to one inning at a time. We're going to have to wait and see how he does. Has to stay healthy, not something that he's been great at doing in the last four or five years. I think you and I advocated for the Tigers to consider signing Robert Stevenson, who has a similar career profile, but at the same time, he added a cutter last year. Miller, kind of similar, adding the split. We're going to have to see what happens. I think this falls right into the calculated risk that Scott Harris has professed to want to take, and we'll see what happens. And Mark, here's my other concern, too. I know we mentioned, you know, sure, there's the health piece to keep in mind. There is, you know, the durability, and is this repeatable, the performance that we saw down the stretch. Again, let's not forget that he was really, really, really good last season when he was healthy. He had a 1.71 ERA over 42 innings, and then he was shut down in September. But let's not forget this right here. Nearly a 12% walk rate in 2023 an 11% walk rate since 2016, and a 9.4% walk rate in his 11-year career. Got to throw strikes. If you don't throw strikes, it's awful hard to be good. Ask Alex Lang. So, you know, uh, we're going to have to hope that Federer and Lund can perform at least some small tweaks of magic to try to get the walk rate under 10%, which would be more than acceptable. I'm hoping that they can do that. All right, we're going to take a break. Then we're going to come back. We're going to get into where the Tiger bullpen is right now. We'll be back. All right, we're back. I want to talk a little bit about the bullpen. I mean, it's such a primary part of how A.J. Hinch manages and impacts winning in the way he manages so much. The Tigers, I think, you know, you never know what a sure thing is. But right now, obviously, they're two leverage relievers, you know, are Lang and Foley. 
They've just added Chafin, so I'd like to think we're up to three leverage relievers now. And hopefully, they can add two or three more that they can weave into leverage, which I think was the exact point of adding Miller. You never know what Brisky's going to do. And, you know, Vest has been very good at times. He's struggled at times. He seems to thrive much more in that fifth, sixth inning type of role. But at that point in time now, you're down to five. We'll see what happens with Bo Brisky. He has to even make the team. You never know. He may have developed a slider over the winter. People surprise you, but... I'm curious what you're hearing and what you think about the bullpen. You you watch this pretty closely and you know what guys are doing in the offseason. So talk to me about what your thoughts are. Yeah, we never know until we really know, right? Because injuries can happen. And, you know, sometimes there are even surprise injuries when you get to camp and you find out that a guy was hurt during the offseason. Normally, you know, the Tigers will put something out if that were to happen. But at the same time, there have been cases where, you know, that's popped up or it's been right down the stretch before camp starts. And, Turns out a guy's actually injured and, and might be sidelined for a little bit. But as it stands right now, my eight-man bullpen, if I had to make a prediction, Jason Foley, Alex Lang, Andrew Chafin, Shelby Miller, Will Vest, Tyler Holton, Bo Brisky, and surprise, Joey Wentz. And I think people are going to look at that Joey Wentz and they're going to say, no way, we don't want him pitching in Detroit. I understand the numbers aren't great. You go back and you look at it. But Joey Wentz is out of options. And Joey Wentz has a lot of things going for him. One is he's got really good extension. Two, he's got some nasty stuff. Three, he's a left-hander. Four, he's young and a former prospect, former first-round pick. Like those guys are coveted across the league. So, you know, if you remove Joey Wentz and you know you want to keep him in your organization, you got to run him through the waiver process because he's out of options. And other teams would jump at the opportunity to pick him up. You don't think that Oakland would take a flyer on Joey Wentz, right? Like I'm pretty sure they would. So, I think Joey Wentz has that going for him. Whereas a guy like you know, let's say. Alex Fido, who I have left out of that bullpen mix. I don't think he makes the bullpen because he has no, because he has one option remaining. He qualified for a fourth year option. So because he has that fourth year option, they can send him down to Toledo, move him back and forth all season long. It's harder to do that with Joey Wentz because you got to run him through waivers and sneak him by all 30 teams. You give 30 teams a chance to pick up Joey Wentz. I think a team is going to do it because he's a lefty and because he has some intriguing things about him. I mean, there's no question about it. his stuff is good, right? But he's got to be in the zone. He's got to be more aggressive. You got to attack. So I got, look, five right-handers in Foley, Lang, Miller, Vest, Brisky, three left-handers in Chafin, Holton, and Wentz, three guys who can go at least three innings and Holton, Brisky, and Wentz. Obviously, that leaves out Alex Vito, Miguel Diaz, Mason Engler, Wilmer Flores. But I think that's a pretty good group to start with. Mark, do you have any disagreements, particularly with the back end of the Brisky and in, in, in the Wentz type conversation with those guys? I like Diaz a lot. I think that he was decent in 2022. He's really good in his 12 innings last year. He added a split, throws pretty hard, could surprise. Wouldn't be shocked if Brisky started the season in Toledo. That's possible. I don't think Diaz has any options left. You are correct. Joey wants interesting, interesting arm. You and I are both very fond of him. We watched him get pummeled, especially his fastball last year. I think people put their hands over their face and their ears when you say the name Joey Wentz now because it just was such a season-long exercise in futility. Quite disappointing. Really close 2022 well, but it was all about command and location and mixing his pitches. So we're going to see what happens. I, I was discussing Joey Wentz with somebody online in the past few days, and it brought up something terrifying, which is, in some ways, how Reese Olsen finished 2023 reminds me of how Joey Wentz finished 2022. And you walk into the season, and we had really high hopes for Joey Wentz, and it just was never right from minute one. And it makes me realize counting on Reese Olsen is good as he was for 100 innings, as great as he was for the last six, seven starts, you just never know, okay? And to count on it until you see it in a young pitcher, I think is fool's gold. So we're going to have to make sure Reese Olsen 
possesses the same command and execution that he did at the end of the year before we start penciling him in as a solid major league starter. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to agree and kind of disagree with you. I hate cutting you off, but like Joey Wentz, if you go back to his 2022, this is a slight concern that I have. I love Joey Wentz because of the stuff, but everyone raved about how good he was in September. AJ Hinch will even talk about how good he was in September, 2022, but the guy had 11 walks in 26 innings. Like that's not very good. He, and he also had 22 strikeouts in 26 innings. So you, you have 11 walks, 22 strikeouts in 26 innings over five starts in September. I understand the ERA looked pretty at 1.73, but when you're walking 11 guys in 26 innings and only striking out 22, that's not great. Reese Olsen, on the other hand, and maybe again, we can maybe make the same case, right? Nine walks, 25 strikeouts in 31 innings. So Reese Olsen wasn't like, eliminating walks across the board that month either. Like, it, it, you know, I, I do see what you're saying in some sense, but I think Reese Olsen has more of a swing and miss stuff. And I also think he probably has, you know, I don't know. I, I just think he's a little bit better than, than Joey Wentz considering like the stuff and the movement and the way that it plays. But I do see some of the similarities and I do get your point. And I don't know, it's just, it's something that's fascinating to watch, right? Because Reese Olsen, he would nibble, nibble, nibble a ton and, you know, be around the edges. And the big thing for him was like, Hey, just go attack, get in the zone. Like, you know, don't, don't, don't chase strikeouts. Just go attack in the zone. Don't be afraid of, you know, weak contact. You can get that too. And so I do think there are some similarities, but again, everyone raved about Joey Wentz in 2022. And I don't know, I just wasn't as much on board with it as maybe other people were. Yeah. Well, we're going to see, you still have to locate your pitches to be good in the major leagues. I think the biggest difference in Reese Olsen at the end of the year and in the middle of the year, he just didn't make mistakes in the middle of the plate. He got absolutely torched when he made mistakes in the middle of the plate in June and July. And he started to, you know, not do that nearly as much in the last six weeks and the results speak for themselves. All right. So you got a chance to talk to Scott Harris about Jack Flaherty. We've covered it pretty extensively. We've covered pitch mix. We've covered what's changed up, but you didn't have a chance to talk to Scott to hear what his specific plans were for Jack. So why don't you share with us what you learned? All right. First, I'm going to tell you what I don't like. What I don't like is that Jack Flaherty had a 3.31 ERA with an 8.4% walk rate and a 28.8% strikeout rate in the first 87 games of his career. Then he had an oblique strain, which turned into a shoulder issue. And after that, it's been a 4.81 ERA with a 10.6% walk rate. So you got a 3.3 ERA, with an 8% walk rate. And now you're at a 4.8 ERA with a, you know, 10 borderline 11, you know, percent walk rate. That's what I don't like. I don't trust Jack Flaherty. I do not trust that this guy's going to be able to turn it around. That's just where I'm at right now. I think he's got a lot of work to do to get there. Now I'm going to tell you what the Tigers see. And they're going to, they, you know, Scott Harris talked about a lot of positive things that they liked, which is understandable. That's why they went out and got him, but I'll take it away. Right. Four seam fastball velocity increased last year from the beginning of the year to September, the strike rate increased from the beginning of the year to September. So he's throwing more strikes, but he also surrendered a lot of hard contact in the second half of the season, possibly because he was throwing more pitches inside the strike zone. I think that's worth noting as well, though he limited walks in September, which was really good. So this is a guy that, you know, fastball velo went up strike rate increased as well. Hard contact is definitely an issue, not missing enough bats. The one thing that they really did like that I find fascinating though, is that his fastball, in 2023 with the Baltimore Orioles after the trade deadline was similar to what it was in 2019. Mark, I know you're a huge fan of the fastball with Jack Flaherty, and you think that might be the biggest thing to unlocking a better version of him. Here's what I found out. So his fastball averaged 14.4 inches of induced vertical break and 4.8 inches of arm side movement in 2019, which is pretty similar to what it looked like with the Orioles after the trade deadline, 14.3 inches of vert, and 3.3 inches of arm side movement. So you go from 14.4 and 4.8 to 14.3 and 3.3. Which was a, pretty, big Im- it was a big improvement. It was though, a huge improvement, yes. From when he was with St. Louis. Which was 13.1 and 1.8. So essentially, the fastball had more ride and run, which means it had less cut with the Orioles in 2023, just like the dominant movement profile in 2019 with the fastball. Now, look, the slider needs to be fixed. That's, I think that's the biggest thing in my opinion, but Mark, I know you're big on the Flaherty fastball, but the fact that the fastball had a closer, like was closer in shape to what it was in 2019 
is a great sign. Now, I do wonder, though, getting that fastball shape closer to 2019, did that harm the slider? Because the slider regressed significantly, especially when he went over to Baltimore. The slider was not very good. And the slider did not miss bats, did not get swing and misses. So did fixing the fastball maybe hurt the slider? I'm not so sure. But opponents absolutely crush Jack Flaherty's slider. And that's the pitch that he needs to be good. He needs to miss bats with that. Which all figures into the parts that you and I discussed, which I was a little worried about signing Jack Flaherty because there's a lot of things wrong. And it's been a pretty long stretch of being ineffective and combined with not being super healthy all the time. So, you know, when you talk about calculated risk, I'm not so sure Jack Flaherty is a calculated risk. But what I will say, and I'll repeat this again, it's very unlikely that Scott Harris had did not have a plan that he did not go over very, very, very intimately with Robin Lund and Chris Fetter before he signed him. That's what I can't leave out of this, though, Mark, is that Jack Flaherty had conversations with A.J. Hinch. He had conversations with Chris Fetter. He had conversations with Scott Harris. Deep conversations. This was like, hey, look, we have this, this, and this that we want to do. And then we also want to do all this stuff as well. But like, we're not even going to worry about that right now. Let's just tackle a couple of these things to start with. And so, look, they put on a recruiting pitch to him. It was, hey, look, we have a plan to help you get better. Are you ready to do it? Jack Flaherty says, yes, I am ready to do it. And the Tigers say, all right, here's our plan. Size it up with anybody else's plan. And, and, and you let us know who you want to pick. And he ends up picking the Tigers, which I think is a huge like positive sign for the Tigers and in, in what they're doing. They're being talked about you know, nationally. You know, Chris Fetter, Robin Lund, the pitching group, being able to fix guys and get them back on track. They've gotten a lot of respect for that. And it's all deserved. And I think this is another great example of that. Now, can they do it again it is the big question. They help Michael Lorenzen get better. Can they do it with Jack Flaherty? We'll find out about that. But I guess it was a long-winded way of saying that, you know, Scott Harris, when he really looks at Jack Flaherty, it's a couple of things. It's, you know, they really want to fix him by, one, helping him miss more bats, and two, limiting hard contact. I also think the fastball is going to be really important. The delivery is going to be important as well. But kind of the main points of the plan are miss more bats. You would assume that would be with the slider. And then also limiting hard contact. We'll see if it happens. Time will tell. Time will tell. I'm excited to see what they do in spring training. I'm sure they're going to go visit him uh, as he throws this winter and get an early start on it. Uh, And like I said, time will tell. All right. We're going to try to queue up our guest. We have a really great guest. Why don't you uh, share with everybody who's coming on with us? Yeah, so this week we got Bobby Scales coming on. He is uh, as good as it gets, man. He's awesome. The vice president of baseball and sports info solutions and analyst on Tigers radio broadcast. And we're excited to have him on for the rest of the podcast. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll dig into things with Bobby. We'll be back. All right, we're back. We're going to welcome Bobby Scales, Vice President of Baseball at Sports Info Solutions and an analyst on Tigers Radio Broadcast for the rest of the podcast. Bobby, how you doing? Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. This is fantastic, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. No doubt. You've been great to get to know over the past year, you know, working with Dan Dickerson on Tigers Radio. But, man, your history is, is pretty impressive. You're not even 50 yet, and you've done so many different things in the game. Born in Southfield, Michigan, played at University of Michigan, drafted by the Padres in 1999, MLB debut with the Cubs in 2009, two seasons in Japan, worked in the front office with the Los Angeles Angels, the Pittsburgh Pirates, VP of Baseball at Sports Info Solutions in March of 2002, also the founder and CEO of the Scales Sports Group in September of 2017. That's a lot of different things, Bobby. Do you ever look back and say, wow, I've done a lot in this game already? I don't. You know, it's funny. I, I, I have been so fortunate and so blessed to have had the opportunities I've had. You know, just like you said, born in, I was born in Southfield in Providence Hospital. And then my, my family moved away to Georgia when I was a young kid, about eight years old. And I grew up mostly in Georgia. But my mother was born on the west side of Detroit, Cooley High School, graduated in 65, all that stuff. And my grandfather's 37 years on the line with Chevrolet. So Blue collar working folks, Detroit, that's, that's, you know, even though I grew up in Atlanta, but Detroit is, is a significant piece of who I am. And, and no, I mean, to, to answer your question more succinctly, I've been, I, like I said, I've been blessed and fortunate. They, this game 
has been so good to me. Even when it was tough on me, it was good to me. Met a lot of wonderful people, done a lot of wonderful things and have had some great opportunities to serve different organizations and different and different entities as a result of, of this stinking game, man, that's uh, so maddening to all of us. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast, obviously. And, and you're somebody that Mark and I, we've been talking about having you on as a guest for, for forever, haven't we, Mark? I've been asking to get you on since, you know, early in the season when you started doing games because your knowledge and the way you present what's going on in the game is pretty unique. I love the perspective. I love you share, you know, the development aspects of how players should be playing or what they need to be learning about playing or how they're executing. And it's a breath of fresh air. It was great to listen to, and we've wanted to have you on for a long time, so I'm glad we can do it today. Hey, one thing I haven't dug into yet, Bobby, is like, how did you end up joining the Tigers and partnering with Dickerson on the radio? What was that experience like in 2023? How did it even happen? And then kind of what are the, the plans for 24? No, sure. And it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty cool story, actually. So I've been longtime friends with J.P. Morosi, just off the charts writer, you know, just reporter and, and all of all things baseball and also does some, a lot of hockey stuff. He's down at Little Caesars a lot. I've been friends with him since like 2003. I think he came right out of Harvard and his one of his first jobs in 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 media and in, 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 in sports reporting was with the Portland Beavers. I was in AAA for the San Diego Padres at the time in Portland, Oregon. And a, and a mutual friend of ours, Matt Hyde at the time, was the assistant coach at Harvard and and just obviously being around the program and doing a lot of the stuff he did for the, for the Harvard student newspaper, he had a lot of dealings with Matt. And so, you know, he told him, he's a, listen, when you get out there, when you get to Portland, you got to look up Bobby scales. He's all, he's one of a true friend of mine, blah, blah, blah. So I I've known, I've known JP for about 20 years now. And he called me late one night in like November of 22. And he was, I think he was driving back uh, to his home uh, from, from Little Caesars at doing, after doing a hockey game, you know, for, for uh, some of his hockey coverage. I believe he works for NBC in hockey. I'm not sure. But in, 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 any, anyway, he spoke with Ron Colangelo and then they said Ron was, you know, trying to look for some, another voice to help out on some of the road games for Dan Dickerson. Uh, with Dan Dickerson, you know, he's given uh, Jim Price's health situation and obviously, you know, you know, God rest his soul. But, but long story short, it was about 1130 at night. And JP calls me and he says, listen, he goes, I know you've been trying to do a few things on the, on, you know, in media and broadcasting, send me what you have, whether it's a podcast. I, I did a few things years ago on MLB network with Harold Reynolds when you Dar- Darvish was coming over. Cause I had played with Darvish that year. We were on the same team in Nippon, Nippon ham. And so I gathered together all this stuff. And by about 1230, one o'clock in the morning, I sent it to him. And by I, it's funny. I was taking my son to his little karate lesson at nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. And I get this, this phone call from this random two, four, eight number. And I'm like, who is this? Like, I'm, you know, everybody from two, four, eight, I knew like it was probably some family or somebody. I'm like, they're not in my phone. Who is this? So I let it go to voicemail. Then I call him back and Hey, Bobby's Ron Colangelo, Detroit Tigers, blah, 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 blah. He says, you got a minute. So we start talking. And so he starts getting deep right out of the gate. And I'm like, Hey Ron, I'm at my son's karate lesson. Can I call you back? Like at like, Two o'clock this afternoon. I promise I'll give you, I'll give you a call back. Sure enough, I call him back. I tell him my story. He he asked me a bunch of questions. And that was about two o'clock, probably about three thirty. He he was asking me how many games I could do on the radio this 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 past season. So it moved pretty quickly. That's how I got the gig. Uh and it was unbelievable uh working with Dan Dickerson. And uh, I can't say enough about the man. I can't say enough about the broadcaster, the level of professionalism, the level of knowledge. Uh, just how hungry and curious Dan is about the game, about learning all aspects of it, taught me everything. You know, from, a, from even from a journalistic point of view, I'm not a journalist. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an ex player. But just you know, questions when I was doing from the the when I got an opportunity to do to do some of the from the field reports, what questions to ask, how to go about it, just everything. I, so I owe a lot of you know my you know this my first year to Dan, just teach, just showing me the ropes, and then uh, yes, I will be back next year. We're, we're trying to figure out what that looks like, how many games and in total and in and, and home and road. Hopefully, I, one thing that's important to me, I do want to get an opportunity to do some games from Comerica. I did 62 games on the road last year, all the, all the road games. So, yeah, so but that that's that's kind of that's kind of how it happened. And, you know, I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate. I, I had been trying to get into doing some broadcasting. I hadn't had any luck thus far, but then to get that call and that opportunity at the major league level is just, it's off the charts. Well, all I can say is, is you well know, 
with your baseball career. If you don't perform, they don't keep you. So if they're keeping you, they obviously (laughs) liked what a good job you did. I know I liked the kind of job you did, but I'm glad they liked the kind of job you did. So let's talk for a second a little bit about what you saw last year, which was a team kind of in transition and progressing, finished 18 and 10 to really give us a lot of things to think about this year. You know, how you think the roster is coming together, the additions they've made and what you're looking at in 2024. Maybe, you know, obviously we're going to feed some prospects and we talk about that a lot, but I want to get your perspective about it. I, I think you saw a team that was very united in the chemistry in the clubhouse is genuine. And, and that comes from, you know, leadership starts from the tip of the spear. And that, that comes from from the skipper, A.J. Hinch. And, and, the, and he's been around winning. Uh, he knows what winning looks like. He knows what the building blocks to winning look like. Right. And so when he's laying the foundation, when he's setting the standard for what performance needs to be, regardless of who's out there, it's not important. OK, well, this guy is not this or he's not that. No, there's, the standard is the standard. And A.J. holds his guys to the standard and he has a tremendous pulse on what's going on in his clubhouse, both with his pitchers and his hitters. And and so I see I saw a team that was that has key core components that are starting to turn the corner as major leagues. And, and, and Evan, we had this discussion. I can't remember where it was, but, you know, we keep talking about turning the corner, turn the corner, turn the corner. Well, the corner is rounded. The corner is not 90 degrees. You don't just turn on the corner and then you're good. That corner is rounded. And, and this, I, I look at it like a track. I mean, there's elements to the corner. There's the beginning of the corner. There's the, there's the true corner itself. And then there's coming out of the corner that you have to get through all of those things as a player and then collectively as a unit to go where, you know, Tiger fans want this team to go, which is eventually lifting that trophy in the last game of the season. I saw guys like Riley Green before the injury take significant leap strides forward. I think that for me, the most encouraging and striking improvement was Spencer Torgelson. You saw the struggles he had the year ago against the fastball. You saw the struggles he had a year ago against off speed and different things. He hit different pitches hard all over the park. And it's not just the 30 and a hundred, but it's how he got there. It was hitting fastballs pull side in the air. It was hitting breaking balls away from him in that gap or over the fence. It was covering all the different pitches. I saw strides defensively with him. So, when you talk about, you know, development, I think you have to talk about it in the sense of individual development. You also have to talk about development in aggregate. Big strides were taken. I, I thought you saw a bullpen that was so reliable for so long, different stretches of the year. There's only a couple stretches during the year where they struggled a little bit and those struggles weren't huge, but they were able to come out of those struggles and then continue to finish. I was going to ask you, you know, you were a hitter, you understand this. And I think sometimes the public doesn't understand, but Spencer Torkelson in 2022 was, he just couldn't, he was always late on the fastball for the first time in his life. And I want you to discuss a little bit because it kind of transitions and it it begs the question for me about Javi Baez, which is Spencer Torkelson did what he needed to do. I think his swing got a little more athletic. He used a slightly lighter bat. He changed his bat a little bit. He took some advice from Mike Trout. And whatever he did, it got him to consistently be on time. And he found a game plan of pulling the ball in the air that really worked for him. And if you look at his chart, that's that's almost, you know, it was probably 95% of his homers were to the left side of second base. And that's great. I mean, Isaac Paredes is getting ready to make a whole lot of money by doing that. But Javi Baez, who has notoriously been a great fastball hitter for his entire career, the last year and a half struggling to get to the fastball. But I wanted you to talk a little bit about how small the difference is between being on time and not being on time, how hard it is to get back there. But I think sometimes I think fans get a lot more frustrated with Baez about what he's not swinging at. And Evan and I are dis- discuss this. You know, we don't pay much attention to the wild swings. What we are paying attention to is the fact that a once great fastball hitter, a once great mistake hitter on breaking pitches has struggled to do that the last two years. But there, there should be some hope for people to understand hitters can get back to that. It's a matter of being willing 
to do what's necessary to get back to it. You as a hitter, you as somebody in, in player development, talk a little bit about that and about the transition you have to make to try to get back to being able to be on time. Well, I think the biggest thing is, like you said, I, I don't care what anybody says. You, you've got you've got hitting Twitter. You've got swing gurus all over the world. You've got guys who are movement specialists. All those guys have a place when you're talking about hitting, when you're talking about the approach, when you're talking about the swing. But it begins and ends with being on time. If you are not on time, all those beautiful movements you have, all those different things you're doing, all those all those feels you're searching for mean nothing. They mean zero. Being on time is a razor thin thing. It's so, so minute, very minute. And, and the saying is, you know, if you, if you're, if you're, what is it? It's, if you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. Right. And finding that mix of being early and at balance in your approach to, to hitting, to approach to the baseball, which is really on time and not being out in front and not being behind. It's so razor thin and it comes and goes. And, and what you see is it's the roller coaster. Like, you have the different peaks, right? And that t- area between is called, is called you know, is, is a trough, right? Making sure that those troughs are shorter and the guys who are able to sustain that, they go in peaks and valleys with it. But the difference is those peaks, the distance between those peaks are very small. They don't stay in the valley very long and the valleys aren't very deep, right? And so I'll, talk, I'll, say, I'll say this in the, in the sense, in the, in the context of both Torque and, and Javi, Torque is trying to find that at the big league level. You got to remember, he didn't have a boatload of, of minor league at bats. And you and one could say, well, he had nothing left to prove at the minor leagues. Well, he didn't. But he got he got to the big leagues in 22 and he got it shoved on him a little bit and had to figure that out and go back, get his confidence back. And to see how he finished this year with, you know, he had a few peaks and valleys, but those the distance between those peaks were really short, which means the valleys weren't that bad either. And so that's that's phenomenal. Secondly, I think with Javi, you're getting to a different point in your career. You know, 30 is not 25, 25 is not 21. And you have to recognize, you have to be humble enough to recognize, okay, athletically, I still feel good. When I take my shirt off, I still look good, but I am not the same dude I was at 25. And you have to recognize that. So it's a different level of adjustment. Maybe it's using a smaller bat for hobby. Maybe it's starting sooner. Maybe it's shortening the leg kick. There's a, a number of different things I'm sure he's going to search for this offseason. Because one thing I do know is when you've had the kind of career he's had and he's you've been the guy he's been, he's been the he's been one of the dudes on a major league world series team that has won a world series. He's been a dude on a WBC team. That's a proud dude. That's, he, he's a proud guy. He wants to be the dude on this Detroit Tiger team again. And so we will see. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. We'll see what that looks like coming into spring training. I think it will be very apparent very early, the adjustments or non-adjustments he's made, because that's typically what happens. I want to ask you about Cole Keith. He's a guy that is fascinating to me because you talk about Torkelson, right, trying to find it at this level. Can a guy like Cole Keith come up and just already have it? Like, is that possible? And and what do you see from Colt Keith? Do you think he could be that kind of a dude? And maybe also too, like how much is the end result for the Tigers in 2024 depend on his performance as a young guy coming up looking to inject more life into this offense? Because again, I, I keep saying it, they got to score more runs. They, they just do, plain and simple. Well, they, I, I think well, there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot in that, que- that, that question. And, and, and you're right, they do need to score more runs. So can Colt Keith come up and do it? Sure, I think he can. Um, I, I think it's going to be very difficult. These the, the special, special players are the guys who come up and don't skip a beat and don't struggle. I mean, even look at guys like, you know, back in the day, Dustin Pejoria came up and hit a buck 89 for a whole September of the year before, but then comes out and wins rookie of the year the next year. Like, you know, Mike Trout, I think was just okay. His first stint in the big leagues. And then the rest has been history with him. And even going back to hobby, you look at it, Mike Trout, different 31 years old. Now it's different. We're going to have to make some adjustments, even though he's still one of the best players on the planet. But I digress. But the, the point is, can he can he can he come up and do it? Sure. I mean, all the all the all the all the 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 measurables are there with him. That you know, if you look at the, the all the tools, the tools are he's he, the kid's a tool shed. There's nothing on the baseball field he can't do. I think the one question is the defense. Where's he going to play? You know, we you know, and and how is he going to play when he gets there? But asking him to be that impactful as a rookie on a team that's trying to make trying to turn the corner, I think it's a lot. It's a lot. Now, I don't know the young man. I've heard only great things about him. I heard the makeup is plus plus off the charts, but it's a lot to come to a place like Detroit that asks a lot of its of, of, of its athletes, you know, and not just not just be a good guy, work hard. You got a ball. <laughs> you know, you got to play when you get here. 
And and it's a lot. So I think I think asking that much of him is going to be is be a tall task. But, you know, I, I don't I'm I'm certain that, you know, Scott Harris and, and, and AJ and the rest of the Tiger Brain Trust, if they didn't believe that, that the, this young man was ready and they didn't believe that there's an alignment around him around him that could support uh, a young player as he's trying to cut his teeth in the big leagues, they wouldn't ask him to do it. That's the big thing, right? What are your thoughts on Torkelson, Green, Kerry Carpenter, you know, another year under their belt? provide some protection for a younger guy like Cole keep coming up because now, you know, Torkelson's not the youngest guy in the room anymore. Neither is Riley green. Well, no. Riley green kind of is right. No. But like you get my point from an experience standpoint, these guys have been there, done that a little bit. How, how big is that? I mean, where does that take the tigers in 2024? Well, when you believe when you're, when you're not, there's different phases of a major leaguer, right? There's okay. I'm here. Can I do it? Okay. And then you kind of, you know, you kind of fake the funk a little bit. Can I do it? Okay. Can I, can I stay here? I can play here. Yeah, I can do it. I can play here. And then it's okay. Can I survive here? Those are two different things, right? Can I play here? Sure. I can play here. Can I survive here? And then can I thrive here? I think for my money, pork and greeny, and even to a certain extent, Kerry Carpenter are in the, can I thrive here stage? They've arrived at it in different ways. They've, you know, they've, they've gone through different struggles to get there. Can I thrive here stage? They've proven they can survive. They've proven they can be productive at the major league level. Now, can I thrive here? And so, you know, I think it's going to be hugely impactful for that trio of young guys that may be up and down up on this roster at certain points in the year or, or you know, whoever that, whether it's Justin Henry Malloy, whether it's Cole Keith, you know, whoever it may be, to have guys who are in that stage, like, yeah, man, you know, just that support system, that support network, I don't care what you're doing. When you have people that are in your peer group age wise, but have a little bit more experience that can help you along the way. And everybody's going towards the same goal. I think it's hugely impactful for the clubhouse. Bobby sh- share with me, you know, Riley green in some ways, I, I don't, you know, when you talk about the thrive part, I think Riley green thinks that he can absolutely mash in the show. Now. I mean, he showed us that last year. I think the question that Riley has to really start asking himself is, you know, how do I stay healthy? I mean, Mm -hmm. because I think if Riley's healthy, everything else is going to take care of itself. If he can play 135, 140 games, we're going to see great things from Riley green. The question is, is, you know, a lot of freak injuries, you know, injuries from playing a lot, playing baseball every day for right. 180 days plus spring training is much harder on your body than people understand. And when you've had a few years of freak injuries, especially to your legs, you know, how do you how do you frame that to yourself and how do you try to overcome it? That's a good question. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near the player Riley Green was. But what I do know is, you know, in 14 years as a professional, I was only not available for 70 games. So I was fortunate to avoid injury. So in answering that question, it's the age old thing. Do you ask a guy not to die for balls with the understanding with that pitching staff? Hey, listen, guys, he we're uh, he, we are a better team with him on the field. The last few times he's dove for balls, he's hurt himself. We are not going to ask him for to die for balls. Now I'm not saying that's what, what AJ and the, in the, in, in the tiger, you know, leadership are going to do, but it's when you're asking a guy, when you're asking a guy to change his game, you're fundamentally asking him to be somebody else. And anything you do in life, when you try to be not authentic to yourself, has that gone well for you? I'll answer that. And I'll say no for myself. Um, so if, if, if Riley green has to play at 95 miles an hour to, to be Riley green, I need him to be that. Now you might have to deal with some injuries. Hopefully not. Hopefully we're through that. And those were just some freak things that happened to him. And then we're not having this discussion uh, in December of 24, but it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to answer, especially with this, you know, it's not like he's had a bunch of hamstring injuries and soft tissue stuff. Just freak stuff has happened to him. And so it's like, it's like, okay, these stats are great, but there's a small sample size. Do you just throw it out? No, you can't because they have happened. You can't look the other way, but it's difficult. It's, it's, there's no, there's no good answer to it. I think, you know, the twins are working through it with Buxton right now. God, every time we put him in center field, he gets hurt. Every time we, you know, we play him too much, he gets hurt, but gosh, he's really, really, really good. We need him out there. So how, how do you go about doing that? And I think it's going to be a work in progress all year. Bobby, do you get Grady Sizemore vibes with Riley green? Ah, uh, God, I hope not. I mean, I, you know, good Grady. Yeah. <laughs> good Grady Sizemore. Good Grady Sizemore was tremendous. The problem was we didn't see good Grady Sizemore enough because he was hurt. And, and that's, it's unfortunate. And again, we're talking about teams in our division. Yeah. You know, I, I want to see Byron Buxton on the field. It's good for baseball. I love the game, 
And yeah, I, I work for the Tigers. I'm Tiger broadcasting all, and we're we're competing against them. I just I, I just don't want to see him 13 times a year. But the other <laughs> hundred and however many times, I hope he's on the field because it's a good good it's good for baseball. Same thing with Grady Sizemore back in the day. Grady Sizemore was tremendous when he was on the field. When he but he was just not on the field enough, and it's sad. So no, I hope I hope we don't get that side of Grady Sizemore with Riley Green. I hope we get good Riley Green for a long time. And he can find a way to play the way he needs to play to be effective. That's another thing. He needs to play the way he needs to play to be effective and be that guy. And and hopefully he can stay away from injury. All right. Let's transition to a few of the moves they made. First, let's talk a little bit about their pitching. Their pitching is, in some ways, I think people don't even understand how good their pitching was in the second half last year. And, yes. you know, you have Ter- Tarek Skubal at the top of the rotation. If he can duplicate anything close to what he did in the last three months of the season, you got, you got a Cy Young candidate. Talk about that, and then talk about the additions of Meta and Flaherty to the rotation. Well, Scuba was unbelievable the last part of the year. I, I love the way his mentality. It's no nonsense. There's some dog in him, uh, and he got beat. He got you know he got touched up in a couple of outings, but he didn't have two bad ones in a row. And then you saw the progression of how he went. Uh, the, the second half of the year, and especially the, the, his last few starts were tremendous. And and just, again, you talk about steps forward. This was a, this was a pitching staff that was already pretty good, and it's getting better. And now they're a year, you're, they're a year older, but still with youth on their side. And that's the best place to be in when you're trying to develop players and you're trying to turn the corner as a franchise, as an organization. Because it, it, for my money, I'm a position player. You know, I, yeah, I hate pitchers, but at the end of the day, it begins and ends on the mound. If you don't, you don't have guys that can throw strikes, throw strikes, throw the throw strikes, have control, but also have command, throw the baseball where they want to, and then do so in, in volume so that you don't have a, you know, you, that you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about injury or what have you. Then if you don't have those things, I got news for you. It's going to be a really long, long year. And the Tigers did what they did last year because the pitching staff was so stable. Even when the starters were a little bit, were a little bit beat up or what have you, that bullpen picked up the slack. They were unreal the majority, the overwhelming majority of the year and gave the Tigers an opportunity to stay in ball games and scratch out runs when they, when maybe the offense was a little, it was a little tough to find runs. So Scooble was unbelievable. I, I love his mentality. It's like I said before, it's no nonsense. There's some dog in him. He's going to get his work done between starts. He's, he's very studious in his preparation. And then there were days, and I believe particularly there was one game we did in Colorado where he didn't have great stuff. And I think he knew it, but he was like, no, I had a bad one. The one before, I don't care if I throw my shoe at this cat to get him out. I'm going to do it. And he got through, I think five or six innings that day. And he was really, really good, even though he didn't have, it wasn't vintage Tarek school stuff. And you need that. Those are the guys you want. You want guys like that to be your bell cow in a rotation, in a pitching staff. He he took a huge step last year. I mean, I saw him. There were so many games when he just bullied teams with his fastball. They just That's could right. do nothing with it. And then the times when he didn't quite have that, he was able to you know mix and match, locate, use off speed, especially his change. And you know, it's just so much variety to his greatness and. Hopefully, he can do that for an entire season and stay healthy. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, they added Kenta Meta, and I think Kenta Meta is a pretty underrated, very good pitcher that knows how to get mm-hmm. people out and knows how to get people out every five days, week mm-hmm. after week. So, talk, talk to us a little bit about, a, you know, adding an arm like that and adding a style like that. I, 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 I this is a, for me, is the under the radar acquisition. And, he doesn't go deep in games, but when he's in the game, he does a couple of things. Well, number one, he he does not walk people. He throws a baseball over the plate, and when you do that, we know that you know you know Scott and 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 Jeff put an absolute premium of not walking people. Get to my head, doesn't walk people. 104 innings last year, 28 walks. Doesn't walk people. He's going to throw it over the dish. He gets you know a moderate amount of. I mean, 10 K per nine. That's 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 pretty good for a starter, but the two point four walks per nine are the one that jump out at you. So if they're gonna if if you're gonna get on against, I mean one point one six nine whip. I mean that's outstanding. Anything under one three is really really good for a starting pitcher. Any really really good period, but he's consistently been under one three his entire career, and that and that's incredible. So you're gonna earn your way on with him. He's gonna locate his pitches. He's gonna he's got a variety of pitches, but then he's also not going to walk you, and he'll get the occasional punch out too. So. That's, I mean, 
the only thing that concerning Sherry 35, you know, and there's a lot, there's a lot of tread off the tire, but you know, really, really confident. Uh, obviously the, the, you know, when you make these acquisitions, you go through the medicals and you, and you, you talk to people, you've done all the analysis and what have you, and they feel comfortable with it at 35. Um, and, and look, I mean, the, the results have been really good as a major league pitcher. So ERA plus of one Oh two. So he's an above average major league pitcher and has been, you know, his, his entire career in, in the States. And, and I, <laughs> I was on the business end of that back in the day when he was just a puppy in Japan in 2011. So, yeah, I got I got a little taste of that too. I can't remember what I did, but I know we played his team and I faced him. I can't remember what happened. I think I have selective memories. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's interesting you say, right? Like this is a guy who obviously is gonna throw pitches in the zone, right? And Scott Harris came out and said it right away. He said, Hey, look, I think the most important influence that Kenta Maeda is gonna have is gonna be helping young starters learn how to use the entire zone and command pitches to all parts of the zone. Those are things that Kenta Maeda is very good at doing, right? And sure, under the radar signing, no doubt. How about under the radar trade with Mark Canna, a guy who is 34, going to be 35. And he's somebody that the Tigers brought in because they said, hey, look, we can see this guy with a 364 on base percentage, which ranks 23rd among 155 players with at least 2,000 plate appearances from 2018 to 2023. One of the best on base guys. His approach, can that rub off on the young players? Can that rub off on a, on a Torkelson, on a Carpenter, on a Green, on a, on a, on a Keith, on Malloy? And they believe it can. So I, I don't know. I look at Mark Canna as being maybe an under the radar type trade as well. A guy who, you know, is only under contract for one year, but clearly the Tigers like his approach. They believe in what he brings. He gets on base. Bobby, from your shoes and from your experiences, can a player like Mark Canna really make that much of a difference behind the scenes as young players are trying to come up, learn the game and figure out the best approach? A hundred percent. Guys like him in the clubhouse, I call them adults in the room. And that's not a slap. That doesn't mean these guys aren't adults. I'm talking about guys who are guys and who have stripes, who got the T-shirt. And not they're, just, they're not just wearing the T-shirt. They're washing their car with that T-shirt at this point because they've got so many years doing it, right? These are grown men, adults in the room. Mark Cannon is going to help that entire offense. And here's the thing. It's not just a sell. It's just, this is not just a, a ceremonial piece of the puzzle. He can still do some things offensively that can help you day in, day out. And for me, that's the key. You can go get a guy that can serve as a DH for uh, 75, 100 games and, and, and what have you. But you need a guy who is a leader, but who is still productive as a major league baseball player. Not only to talk to the young guys and say, hey, Torque, this is what I'm seeing out of you. When I was a young player in your position, I saw this. He can do that, and then two two batters later, go do some damage with something in a gap or over a fence. That's the key. You, we don't the, the 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 you know you need a player that can still do those things, and Mark Cannon can still do those things. And and that was that's to me that's the key. You just can't go get a player to have him serve as a high paid coach. You got to get a guy who can still ball a little bit and also provide some of those lessons. And here's another thing: you're not forcing him out of his person to do it. That's who he is. You talk to the people, you know, close to some of the organizations he's played with. No, it comes, it's natural. He's natural leader. Like that's who he is. He doesn't, he doesn't have to stretch himself to be that person. He's being that person naturally, but he, while he's still productive as a player, that's what's, that's absolutely vital. And, and not just that, but, but what he brings to the team, it's the on base, it's the selectivity in the strike zone. It's, it's the damage he can do when he gets the one he wants. Those are things that, that rub off because he hits a ball in a gap. He hits a homer. And maybe he punched out the two at bats before, but he was looking, he's being very selective of what he wanted to do. Or he took two strikes and he poked something the other way, the at bat before, and maybe he didn't get anything out of it, but he didn't punch out. So then it's after the game, it's sitting next to Spencer Torkelson in his locker. Hey, man, uh, you know, this is, Tork, this is what I saw. I mean, this is what I was thinking when I did that. And I knew if I got him again, that he was going to do XYZ to me. And I hunted that pitch and I got it and I didn't miss it. Those, those conversations are worth, that, that's worth the whole contract right there because now you've just helped Spencer Torkelson get better. That's perfect. And that's exactly, I think Torkelson is probably the guy that could benefit most from having Mark Canna around for a year. Bobby, I want to jump back to the last question and the way you answered it at the end facing Kenta Maeda, right? You know, people forget you played over in Japan for two years and you got a lot of experience against a bunch of different players in a, in a completely different league, different styles of pitchers. There's a lot of buzz this offseason. Yoshinobu Yamamoto signs a 12-year, $325 million contract with the Dodgers, plus the $50 million posting fee. And oh yeah, Yamamoto gets a $50 million signing bonus as well. High risk, high reward investment. What do you know about what Yamamoto did in Japan? 
How do you think he will transition to the big leagues just based off of your performance and what you remember from your days playing in Japan? Well, I mean, that's such a deep question. We'll start with, with Yamamoto. This guy's he's filthy, man. It, it is absolute filth. It's a plus plus fastball. He can throw it up in the zone. He can throw what they call the shoot which is nothing more than a two seam. The shoot really, the two seam fastball over here in Western baseball, it really sinks quite a bit. It's sink over run. The shoot in, in kind of in, in the Asian style is really more run over sink. It's going to run much more horizontally than it's going to do anything north and south. And what typically happens with a lot of those guys when they come over here, because the mounds are higher to throw at a different angle, he's able, he'll be able to get some sink on that fastball. So he can sink it. He can ride at the top of the zone. The split is filthy. And he's got command of a, of a, of another breaking ball too. And what, what he did, to, the, the, what he did to a lot of those hitters over there, especially in a league that, you know, Asian baseball, they just pride themselves on putting the ball in play. You will see some of the latest, shortest swings ever just to, Tip balls and foul balls off. He got a bunch of strikeouts over there too. His stuff will play. He will be dominant here in in a, in short order. I mean, just that's just that's what it is. And so, as far as the style of play over there, and, and as far as my experience over there, I, I remember the day I got there, I was playing for Nippon Ham, which is way up on the island of Hokkaido in Japan. Japan's really shaped like a J, and there's a northern island called Hokkaido that's on the top of that J. And we, I met the team on the road in Tokyo and I got there and we were playing Cebu Lions and Cebu had a guy on the team named Mayo Fernandez and Mayo got a cup of coffee in the big leagues with, with the, with the Expos and then spent the next 12 years in Japan. And so he was over there and you have, you know, you have what they call gaijin time. Gaijin time is kind of the t- the time between batting practice for one team's walking off, the other team's going on and and it's like the one time a day where you don't need your interpreter to like talk to somebody. It's wonderful. <laughs> so, and so you have that time. And so he comes with me, Hey man, good to see you. Nice to have you over here and everything. And I said, Hey, he goes, Hey, you think you know about baseball? I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran guy. But I've seen a few things. He goes, okay, take everything you know about baseball. And there's a trash can in that dugout, put it in the trash can, Bobby, because it's different here. And so you just learn, you, you, you learn, a very different way. If you give into it, now you see guys go over there and come back quickly and they fail because they weren't able, they, they weren't willing to have an open mindset about it. But if you get, if you, if you just yield what you think, you know, about the game and you're willing to open and you open your eyes and you open your ears and you open your heart really to, to, to learning different ways of going about training, about playing, about, you know, what have you, it can make you a much better baseball player. I know for a fact. I mean, I was on the backside of my my of my athletic arc at 34, 35 years old. And I came back a way better baseball player than I went over. 100% facts. And there's really good baseball players over there. Now, there's clearly not the depth of baseball players over there. Just from a sure numbers perspective. But the guys who are at the top of the food chain over there, I believe a lot of them could come over here and be successful without question. And, and, you know, you've seen Kent and have a nice career over here. You've seen the Darvishes of the world. You've seen, obviously Otani's on a different planet. That doesn't even, he, you know, he could, he could be a one, one on Mars. It doesn't matter, you know, but there's good, there's guys who are good players. The guy in Boston, his name escapes me. He had a nice year as a first year player in this, at this level. And listen, you've seen what they've done in WBC when they put their stars together and you can say, Oh, we don't care. This team doesn't, it doesn't matter. They show up and they ball. So, and and this sake kid is electric too. I can't wait. We've done a, we've done a lot of not, not to plug the company, but we've done a lot of analysis with him on on Sports Info Solutions. Our guys over there, Mark Simon, Brandon Two, do a great job. Brandon Two does a tremendous job with all things Asian baseball. But uh, yeah, no, there's there's real players, both pitching and position players over there, and it doesn't surprise me when those guys come over and have success. Well, listen, I, all I can say is is that. We got to have Bobby Scales back on a few more times because there's just so many more things that we want to talk about, (laughs) about the state of baseball, more Tiger stuff, about just so many things. And, you know, we we touched on a lot of things, but I just feel like we left more on the table than we even got to. So I want to thank you. I want to tell you how much I'm looking forward to listening to you this season. I'm looking forward to the season because for the first time in a long time, I actually think the Detroit Tigers might be able to compete, win a few games, and maybe surprise a few people. Maybe do uh, a little bit of the Arizona Diamondbacks in 2024. As I said, can't wait to talk to you again and really appreciate having you on. Hey, Bobby, before we let you get out of here, are you on board with that? Little Arizona Diamondbacks, you know, 2024 from the Tigers? Like, really, though, like, I want to ask you do, you, do you think they have a shot to actually make some noise and maybe get in considering the division? 
No, I, I do. And I, I think the, the caveat there is a division, like, and it's no disrespect to you know any other other teams, but I mean, 87, win, 87 wins, I don't think wins any other division. And I, I know it doesn't win any other division and 87 wins doesn't, you know, I, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't make the playoffs anywhere else. So at the end of the day, you know, no, you know, there's no flowers for second place, but the Tigers took a significant step forward last year. Get some guys back, get some guys healthy, continue with, you know, the additions, that Scott and Jeff and, and, and the rest of Tiger Brain Trust have made this offseason, they do what they're supposed to do and guys take a step forward. Why not? Why not us? Why not 24? True yeah, that. No, I agree. They, 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 you know, look, you got a team, you're adding Flaherty, Maida, Miller, a full season of Meadows, Colt Keith, you know, you, you're ad- adding legitimate Major League Baseball players and mm-hmm. some pretty decent high-end talent that you know, you got guys, you know, Meadows and Keith, they're going to hit down in the order. Those are, those are pretty impactful players. So. And I want to, and I want to touch on that even for, for a second here, because if you can keep those guys, if those guys can be if the guys at the top of the order can be productive and you can keep a cold Keith, you can keep a Parker Meadows down in the order. I think it gives them so much more confidence. You see what the Braves did with, with Michael Harris, the second, a couple years ago, when he came up, go catch the ball, run everything down the center field, catch everything you can get to even call off Acuna, but catch it. And then you saw, he started out ninth. He started out, you know, moved to sixth, and then against right-handed pitching at the end of his rookie year, he's hitting third in the order for a team that was going to win the one world series. And then they, you know, obviously they didn't win last year, but he took after he got back from the back uh, problems he had early in the year, another significant step forward in his offensive development. So, yeah, I think it's important for those guys at the top of the order to do what they're supposed to do to keep guys like Parker Meadows. And if it's Colt Keith, if it's Justin Henry Miller, whoever that is at the bottom of the order where they can, they can, they can do what they need to do and learn at the major league level. That's a huge, that's a huge piece for them. Yeah. I'm excited to see what both those guys can do. I I think, you know, Meadows, it was good to get, you know, 40 games out of the way, let them fail a little bit and let them come back from that. I think the defense is going to play no matter what. So, all right, listen, Bobby, thanks for spending so much time with us. It's been educational. We've loved it. We'll have you back on and uh, I'm sure I'll see you down in Lakeland in, in about 60 days, man. The pleasure was mine. This was a whole lot of fun and yeah, let's get this cart, crank this thing up. All right. Thanks. All right. You bet. Well, I hope everybody loved that Scales interview. I'm ready to have him on again next week, the week after that, and the week after that, because just if you loved what we talked about, there was about another half hour we talked about things with him off the air and talked about things that had nothing to do with what we just discussed that were amazing. So we got to have him back. I love that. And, you know, I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, hey, hat tip to the Tigers, by the way, for making that happen this year. I, I thought that was a really good decision, right? When you really reflect back on what he brought to the broadcast on the road, I hope he gets to do more games. I hope he gets to do more games across the board. As many as he wants to do, I hope he gets the chance to do them because Bobby's as good as it gets. And I thought the Tigers made a home run a higher, you know, picking him up and, and adding him to the did. fold. He, no he's, doubt. He's great. He's got vast knowledge. He knows how to share it well. And he's All done right, everything in the game. Everything in the All game. Right. All right, before we get out of here, I I, I just want to say to you, Evan Petzold, this is uh, coming to the end of 2023. This was year one of Days of Roar. We knew each other, but doing this together has been some of the most fun I've had in a long time. I had no idea that we would have this much fun, but there's been a lot of growth. And we've now done 40 podcasts together in 2023. It's been a great year for me. I hope I hope that you've had a, a good time doing this with me as much as I've had a good time doing it with you. I've gotten to know you. I've gotten to know Savannah, our agent. Definitely an upgrade to, to, <laughs> to, to your life, no doubt about it. That was overachievement. You did a lot of things this year. You got married. So... Looking forward for 2024 to have a lot more fun, expand upon what we did, and hopefully we can uh, do even better in 2024 than we did in 2023. Hey, look, big things ahead for us, for sure. No doubt about it. Uh, Man, you're making me emotional talking like that. And I'm an emotional guy, so I I really appreciate all the kind words. I have loved almost every minute of doing this with you. No, every minute I've, I've loved it, man. It's been great. I mean, we enjoy each other and 
we enjoy the banter, good conversation. It's always fun. And yeah, man, great guests have come on. We've done, we've done a lot of good things in year one. But again, like there's so much more ahead for us. And I can't wait to see what 2024 holds for Days of Roar. I just want to let the internet know. Evan is six foot four inches tall. Mark Gorosh is six foot three inches tall. We are not a basketball team, but we are tall. And one of us is good looking. The other one is formally good looking. So for Evan Petzl, this is Mark Gorosh. I want to thank our executive producers, Kirk Crawford and Anjanette Delgado. I want to thank my grandson, Braden Michael Gorosh. I want to wish everybody a very happy new year and peace.